What happens inside the body when you consume rat poison? Before we get into the science, let's explore some jaw-dropping real-life incidents that shed light on the dark consequences of these toxic substances. In China, a shocking plot unfolded when students tragically lost their lives after drinking yogurt spiked with rat poison. Believe it or not, it was all part of a twisted scheme by a nursery school head teacher to tarnish the reputation of a rival institution. And that's just the beginning. In another heart-wrenching incident, a student in India found herself in a terrifying situation when she attempted to use rat poison as a desperate measure to stop her father's alcohol addiction. The consequences, unbearable stomach pain, giddiness that landed her in hospital. In 2013, a desperate Eastern Cape mother allegedly used rat poison to kill herself and three of her four children. The police preliminary investigation found that the family was desperately poor and the mother had become despondent. And guess what? This was the second case of its kind in the Eastern Cape in just over a month. Back in 2020, a woman in South Africa and two of her children died after eating rat poison at their home in Pumalang. So just to give us a little bit of a picture, how do these patients present when they get to the hospital? A 29-year-old male presented to the emergency department after suicide attempt by ingesting a large amount of rat poison. According to the emergency medical services, that occurred just prior to arrival. Although the EMS had been told that the patient had ingested a rat poison, the exact type of the rodenticide was unknown. Upon arrival to the emergency department, the patient was diaphoretic and in moderate respiratory distress. This man was awake but appeared to be confused and was not answering questions. Excessive secretions were noted, his neck was supple, he had respiratory distress and harsh breath sounds and ronchi according to both lung fields. He was tachycardic but had a regular rhythm. The abdomen was soft and non-tender with increased bowel sounds. The patient had urinated on himself. He was moving all limbs but had some muscle fasciculations. His skin was diaphoretic but no rash or track marks were evident. As said earlier, he was confused, uncooperative and not speaking. The pupils were 2 millimeters and non-reactive to light. Cranial nerves otherwise appeared to be intact. It was very difficult to assess his motor, sensory and cerebellar function because he was very uncooperative. The horrors of intentional and non-intentional rat poisoning or what is medically referred to as organophosphate poisoning does not end there. From South Africa to the United States, tales of despair and tragedy emerge as individuals driven by desperation or despondency turn to rat poison as a means of ending their suffering. It's a stark reminder of the lethal power that these substances hold and the devastating impact that they can have on human lives. So buckle up friends as we embark on a journey into the intricate workings of the human body when faced with a deadly cocktail of rat poison. Stay tuned because what you're about to learn might save a life. And please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And let's delve into the mysteries of rat poison together. So just what are rat poisons? Rat poisons are mixed compounds used to eradicate rodents. They are one of the most toxic agents commonly found in households. Back in the days, heavy metals such as arsenic were the first agents used to control rodent populations. But the most common rodenticide used in the first century is anticoagulants. These rodenticides are available in various formulations such as powders, pellets, pastes, cereal baits, or blocks. The global burden of rat poisoning varies from region to region. In the United States, for example, rodenticides account for 0.3% of 2.3 million human exposures as reported to the regional poison control centers. Research also shows that pesticide self-poisoning is a major clinical problem in many parts of the world. 
probably killing about 300,000 people every year. Although most deaths occur in rural areas of the developing world, pesticide poisoning is also a problem in industrialized countries. There is three modes of poisoning. One is by ingestion. This can happen either by accidental or intentionally ingesting rat poison. Inhalation, especially seen with the phosphine gas that is produced as a result of metal phosphides reacting with water. And the third one is the demo root. Although this is very rare, poisoning by this root has also been reported. The main ingredients in rat poison vary from one product to another. These may include warfarin, super warfarin such as brodifalcum which is the active ingredient in most rat poisons. Others may contain bromadiolon, chlorofacinon, diphenacom, diphacinum, bromethan, and red skew. But how do these super warfarins cause poisoning? They work on reducing vitamin K in the body which leads to decreased blood clotting ability and if clotting ability is reduced significantly, bleeding can occur. But just how much rat poison do you need to get sick? It has not been established how much is needed. It varies from person to person. However, based on cases where bait has been consumed, a significant amount of bait in a contaminated food would need to be eaten to cause poisoning. Some have put the lethal dose to be around 1 milligram per kilogram. Some have also said that the minimum amount required to depress normal blood clotting in children is estimated to be approximately 1.5 milligram for a child weighing 10 kilograms. And remember, Commonly available baits contain up to approximately 50 mg per kg. Therefore, to eat 1.5 mg of brodifalcum from bait, a child would need to eat approximately 30 grams of bait. That would be equivalent to a number of teaspoon sized doses. And the amount needed in an older child or an adult would approximately be higher as the body weight is increased. In the first 24 hours post-ingestion, patients normally present with mild symptoms such as nausea and vomiting. This is due to gastrointestinal irritation. There is further symptoms. Remember, the active ingredient in rat poison is a super warfarin called brodifalcum, which is used in baits to cure rodents such as mice and rats. It is called a super warfarin because it is longer acting than the drug warfarin. And remember, warfarin is used to prevent blood clots in people. And warfarin is a competitive inhibitor of vitamin K exposide reductase complex 2. And subsequently, that inhibits the clotting casket factors, your factor 2, 7, 9 and 10. So then what happens? In effect, a patient presents with hematuria, hemotysis, epistaxis, flank pain, easy bruising, and sometimes intracranial hemorrhage. In the next 24 to 72 hours, most patients remain asymptomatic. There may be a rise in bilirubin levels, and liver enzymes at this stage. After 72 hours, some patients manifest with acute liver failure, coagulopathy, hypotension, cardiac arrhythmias, and acute kidney injury. Central nervous system involvement occurs as confusion, psychosis, hallucinations, and coma. The treatment to proven poisoning is vitamin K. Exactly how this is given will depend on the person's clinical condition. Since brodifalcum is a long-acting anticoagulant, treatment may be needed for some weeks, but this will vary from case to case. So what happens in the emergency room when the staff realize that the patient possibly has taken organophosphate or rat poison, they put on gloves, don in gowns and masks, all of the patient clothes are removed and discarded in plastic bags. The patient is washed with soap and water to avoid contamination. Part of the initial assessment involves checking the airway breathing and circulation. As part of this process, high flow oxygen is provided if available to ensure a patent airway and most of these patients end up being intubated. After intubation, what next? Most patients are treated with atropine, pralidoxine and lorazepam to improve the patient's respiratory status. Thereafter, the patient is admitted into the intensive care unit. Do all patients require atropine? 
No. A five root assessment is done to assess whether the patient requires atropine. These five steps include meiosis, excessive sweating, poor air entry into the lungs due to bronchorrhea and bronchospasm, bradycardia, and hypotension. If none of these signs are present, then the patient does not yet have clinical cholinergic poisoning and therefore does not require atropine. Because atropine dries secretions and reduces bronchospasm, its administration will improve patient oxygenation. Therefore, it is preferable that atropine is given without delay, especially in cases where oxygen is unavailable. Most patients end up being weaned off the ventilator and extubated without difficulty within four to five days. However, it must be said that depending on the toxicity, the amount of rat poison consumed and the type of it that is consumed, some patients do not do well and they end up dying. So what's the takeaway from today's adventure? Keep those rat poisons under lock and key, away from curious kiddos and furry friends. And if you suspect any poisoning, don't hesitate to reach out to your poison control center. Together, we can keep our homes safe and sound. That's a wrap for today, friends. Look out for part two of this video that explores further on rat poisons. Until then, stay curious and stay safe.